Albert Einstein is unquestionably the most iconic scientist in modern times. He pretty much sets the image most people have for what a physicist looks like. A white man with a mustache, wild white hair, a German accent, and an otherworldly air. Einstein is so firmly lodged in people's imagination as THE canonical scientist that as late as 2009, he was the second most popular choice of people asked to name a living scientist, despite the survey being taken 54 years after his death. Einstein's name also conjures up images of some of the most brain-bending theories in the history of science. He's best known for his theories of relativity, which transformed our understanding of space and time. Special relativity tells us that time depends on how you're moving. A moving clock ticks more slowly than one at rest. General relativity tells us that the very structure of space and time is warped by gravity, making clocks tick more slowly near massive objects, and bending light onto curved paths. But Einstein also made key contributions to the theory of quantum mechanics, which tells us that light waves actually behave like particles, and that material particles like electrons actually have some wave nature. In his later years, he broke with the theory over philosophical difficulties relating to the randomness inherent in quantum theory and the spooky interactions that seem to connect particles over long distances. He was wrong about some of these concerns, but even his mistaken ideas still proved to be insightful and stimulated later breakthroughs. Together, these theories have utterly transformed our understanding of the universe and our place in it. They have also proven enormously important for modern technology, particularly quantum physics. Without an understanding of the quantum nature of electrons, we wouldn't be able to make the computer chips that are central to so many modern devices. Without an understanding of the quantum nature of light, a topic Einstein made key early contributions to, we wouldn't be able to make the lasers that carry the internet over a global network of fiber optic cables. Without both quantum physics and relativity, we wouldn't have the global positioning system to help us navigate through our daily lives. Both quantum mechanics and relativity have been around for a hundred years and are the subject of innumerable books. But popular treatments tend to emphasize the difficult and troubling aspects of these theories. This leaves many non-physicists with the impression that the science Einstein is known for is very far removed from our everyday reality. The phenomena they describe seem abstract and esoteric, things that only matter if you've got a billion-dollar particle accelerator or are orbiting near a supermassive black hole. Except that can't be true. Physicists inhabit the same everyday world as everybody else, and we don't just make theories up for no good reason. The modern theory of quantum mechanics exists because physicists were led to it by observations made right here in the everyday reality we all deal with. This course will be all about how the exotic physics of quantum mechanics, and even relativity, connect to mundane phenomena and technologies that we experience in everyday life. You might be surprised to learn just how familiar you are with these observations. We're surrounded by devices that depend on quantum phenomena for their operations. Cameras, clocks, and computers, among others. But even more basic features of the natural world are fundamentally quantum. In fact, you probably see one of the key phenomena every morning when you cook breakfast. Everything we know about quantum physics starts with the red glow of the heating elements in a toaster. The glow of a hot object is a very simple and universal phenomenon. Take an object, any object, and heat it up, and it will glow red, then yellow, then white. The precise color depends only on the temperature. Physicists call this blackbody radiation, and it doesn't matter what the object is made of or how you get it hot. No matter what you have, if you get it to the same temperature, it will glow in exactly the same way. A clear rod of glass and a black rod of iron heated to the same temperature emit light of exactly the same color. 
Physicists describe the color of objects in terms of their spectrum, the amount of light the object emits at every possible wavelength. What we call visible light falls in a particular band of wavelengths, from violet light at around 400 nanometers up to deep red light at around 700 nanometers. But of course, there are many wavelengths that our eyes don't register. As we move to wavelengths below 400 nanometers, we have ultraviolet light, then X-rays and gamma rays. And as we move to wavelengths longer than 700 nanometers, we have infrared, then microwave, then radio waves. Each wavelength has a corresponding frequency, which varies in the opposite direction. Short wavelengths have high frequencies. Long wavelengths have low frequencies. The two are simply related. The wavelength multiplied by the frequency is always equal to the speed of light. So physicists tend to switch back and forth between wavelength and frequency using whichever is most convenient for a particular problem. We'll do that a couple of times in this lecture. The spectrum of light from blackbody radiation is appealingly simple. We can represent this spectrum as a line on a graph showing the amount of light emitted at every possible wavelength for an object at a given temperature. As we start at long wavelength and low frequency and move to shorter wavelengths and higher frequency, we see the amount of light emitted slowly increase, rising to a peak at a particular wavelength. Then the amount of light being emitted drops very rapidly to zero. The position of the peak, the particular wavelength at which the object emits the most light, changes with temperature. The higher the temperature, the shorter the wavelength where the peak occurs. This explains the change in color. At low temperatures, the peak is off in the infrared, too long a wavelength for our eyes to see. At room temperature, the peak wavelength is around 10,000 nanometers. As the temperature increases, the peak moves first into the red wavelengths, then yellow, and so on. At a temperature of a few thousand degrees Celsius, the peak spans the entire visible spectrum, so it appears white to us. No matter what the temperature of the object is, the shape of the spectrum is always the same. On the long wavelength side of the peak, a long tail, and on the short wavelength side, a steep drop. As temperature increases, the total amount of light increases, and the peak moves to shorter wavelengths, but the shape is exactly the same. A German theoretical physicist named Max Planck found a mathematical formula that describes this shape and how it depends on temperature in 1899, but it was purely empirical. It fit the data, but there was no explanation of why it should be that particular shape. The simple universal behavior we see in the black body spectrum is like catnip for theoretical physicists, because such a simple phenomenon seems like it should have a simple and elegant explanation. Through the late 1800s, a lot of really smart people tried to explain the light we see from hot objects, but all of them failed. The guy who finally succeeded in 1900 was the same Max Planck who had found the formula for the shape the previous year. But to do it, he had to resort to a weird trick, and in the process, he kicked off what became the quantum revolution. To explain what Planck's trick was and why it was revolutionary, I'll first have to explain a model that doesn't work, because it illustrates the key ideas more clearly. The picture I'll use comes from two British physicists, Lord Rayleigh and James Jeans, and actually postdates Planck's correct model by a few years. But it gives a clear illustration of what the problem was and how Planck's trick fixes it. To get a simple universal curve like the black body spectrum, you want to start with a simple and universal principle. The key idea comes from thermodynamics and is called equipartition. As the name suggests, equipartition simply refers to an equal division of energy. You take the energy contained in the hot object and divide it equally among all the possible wavelengths of light that the object could emit. The total energy of the light emitted at each one of the allowed wavelengths is exactly the same, and when you add them all up, you should get the black body spectrum. It may seem strange to talk about all the possible wavelengths, since we think of wavelength as a continuous property, able to take on absolutely any value we might want. Continuous variables can be difficult to work with, though, 
because they allow infinite possibilities. So physicists often prefer to set up a mathematical model that breaks the wavelengths up into a limited set of possibilities that can be numbered and counted. Once we understand those and have a formula for how they work, we can use tricks from calculus to convert the results back to the continuous case. To understand what Rayleigh and Jeans were doing then, we need a model of what exactly a black body is that gives us a way to count possible wavelengths. Thankfully, there's a nice answer for that based on what experimentalists actually did to observe the spectra. You take a box with a small hole in one end and look at the light that comes out of the hole. As long as the hole is small compared to the size of the box, this is an excellent approximation of a black body. A ray of light that enters the hole would need to bounce around a bunch of times with a little light absorbed each time before it could find its way back out. If the hole is small enough, the light will be completely absorbed long before it could reach the exit again. That's why it's called a black body, because it absorbs light of every possible frequency. If we see light coming out from the hole, then, it has nothing to do with the light that comes in from the outside, all of which gets absorbed. The light that comes out is just the light that's allowed to exist inside the box. We can figure out which wavelengths are allowed in the box, give them each an equal share of the heat energy available, and hopefully their sum will amount to a blackbody spectrum. It may not seem obvious that this is an improvement, but in fact, finding the wavelengths allowed in a box is a familiar problem from the world of music. It's basically a pipe organ. We can think of an organ pipe as a box in the form of a long tube with sound waves in it, and a small opening at one end to let some of those waves out. Differently sized pipes have different collections of allowed wavelengths, and thus produce different tones. So what are the wavelengths that fit in a box? Well, they're constrained by the walls of the box. The sound wave in the pipe, or a light wave in a metal box, has to go to zero right at the wall. So only certain wave patterns can fit. The ones where the wave starts at zero at one end and returns to zero at the other end. This happens for particular values of the wavelength that are simply related to the size of the box. As we start down this road, you might worry that we're going to end up with a spectrum that isn't really universal, but depends on the size and the shape of the box. Macroscopic objects are enormously huge compared to the wavelength of light, though, which lets physicists use a well-known math technique to remove the properties of the box from the final answer. With that in mind, let's look at a few examples of wave patterns one might find in the box, our experimental black body. The simplest wave pattern that will fit inside a box starts at zero, goes up to some maximum, then comes back down to zero at the other end. This will oscillate. Sometime later, the wave will start at zero, go down to a minimum, then back up to zero. But the key here is that the two ends are always fixed. This type of pattern is called a standing wave, because the nodes where the wave is zero never change position. The simplest standing wave pattern looks like half of a sine wave, so the wavelength associated with it is twice the length of the box. There's also a characteristic frequency associated with it, given by the speed of the wave divided by the wavelength. In a musical context, we would call this frequency the fundamental tone. In the case of our pipe organ, it's the primary note associated with a pipe of a given length. But of course, there are a lot of other standing wave patterns that also satisfy the condition of being zero at the ends of the box, leading to the harmonics that give a real musical instrument a richer sound than a single sine wave at the fundamental frequency. The next of these fits one full sine wave into the length of the box and has a frequency twice that of the fundamental. This adds another fixed node right in the center where the wave is always zero. Then there's a harmonic that looks like one and a half sine waves at three times the fundamental frequency. Then one that looks like two full sine waves at four times the fundamental frequency, and so on. We call these wavelengths allowed modes, and we can assign each of them a number. The fundamental is one, the first harmonic is two, and so on. 
This lets us count up the number of allowed modes and write down the wavelength and frequency for any arbitrary mode. The nth mode will have a wavelength of twice the length of the box divided by n, and a frequency of n times the fundamental frequency. This gives us a set of allowed modes, and now we just need to divide the energy between them. There are, in fact, an infinite number of standing wave modes that go to zero at both ends of the box, but it's the kind of infinity that physicists invented calculus to deal with. This counting of modes is a well-known type of problem, and it's the most obvious attack on the black body spectrum. When we try to combine these modes with the idea of equipartition, though, as did our friends Rayleigh and Jeans, it fails spectacularly. Remember, equipartition here means giving every allowed mode an equal share of the energy in our hot object, and then adding them up to arrive at the black body spectrum. The problem is that as you go up the scale of harmonics, the modes get closer and closer together. There's a big wavelength difference between the fundamental and the first harmonic, but the difference between the first and second harmonics is smaller, and the difference between the second and third is smaller still. If we look at the total amount of light in a narrow band of wavelengths, the way we do in an actual spectrometer, the number of allowed modes that fall within that band just keeps going up and up as we move the center of the band to shorter wavelengths. This model doesn't look too bad at long wavelengths, which is why Rayleigh and Jeans were working on it, but it doesn't produce a peak like we see in the real black body spectrum. Instead, the amount of light in a given range of wavelengths just keeps going up and up forever. The model predicts that any hot object should spew out an infinite amount of light in the ultraviolet and X-ray part of the spectrum. This is not exactly a feature you want in a toaster. This failure is so spectacular that it picked up a colorful name, the ultraviolet catastrophe, which would be a good name for a band. Planck started his attack on the black body spectrum from a different place than Rayleigh and Jeans, but he hit an exactly analogous problem. The obvious approach of mode counting and equipartition just gives you way too much light at short wavelengths and high frequencies. The result ends up looking entirely unlike the actual spectrum we saw earlier. And this is where Planck ended up using a desperate trick. In setting up another attempt at the problem, he introduced a new idea, now called the quantum hypothesis, about the way that light gets emitted. He said that each frequency of light that exists in the box must be produced by what he called an oscillator in the walls emitting light at that particular frequency. He didn't have a detailed physical model for these. This was more than a decade before the modern picture of atoms was developed. But he reasoned that something in there must be vibrating at the frequency associated with the light. He assigned each of these oscillators a characteristic energy equal to its frequency multiplied by some small number. Then he added the really critical rule that a given oscillator can emit energy only in integer multiples of this characteristic energy. One unit, two units, three units, but never one and a half units or pi units. He was doing this to set up a particular calculus trick and expected to take the small number to zero at the end of the problem, which would go back to a smooth and continuous distribution of energy. To his surprise, though, this method worked out only if that small number was not zero, in which case the quantum hypothesis fixed the ultraviolet catastrophe. To see how it works, we can go back to our picture of a simple set of modes, each getting an equal share of the energy available from heat, but add in Planck's quantum hypothesis. Let's say that the energy share is low enough that it's just six times the characteristic energy of the fundamental mode. In that case, the black body would emit six units of light at the fundamental frequency. The first harmonic, mode number two, has twice the frequency of the fundamental, so its characteristic energy is twice as big. Thus, we get three units of light at this frequency. Mode three has a frequency three times the fundamental, so it emits two units of light. When we get to mode four, though, Planck's rule kicks in. 
This has a frequency four times that of the fundamental mode, so it should get to emit one-fourth as many units of light. But that would be one and a half units, and only integer values are allowed. So thanks to the quantum hypothesis, we only get one unit of light at this frequency, which is less than we would have expected. As the frequency keeps going up, the characteristic energy gets larger and larger, and eventually is bigger than the share of the energy that would be allotted to that frequency. In our model, that happens at mode 7, which should emit 6 sevenths of a unit of light. It's only allowed to emit light in integer units, though, so in fact it can't emit any light, and neither can any of the higher frequency modes. Planck's quantum rule thus does exactly the thing we need to fix the ultraviolet catastrophe. It squashes the emission of light in short wavelength, high frequency modes. At some particular frequency, the characteristic energy needed to emit one unit of light becomes greater than the amount of energy available from heat for emitting light at that frequency, and the emission gets shut off. If you're paying close attention, you might be saying, wait, doesn't stopping the emission at high frequency free up the energy that would have been allocated to those modes? That's a good catch. The full treatment of this has to adjust the share of the energy allotted to each mode based on the quantum hypothesis cutting things off. Again, this is exactly the kind of problem that we invented calculus to solve. This picture, combining the idea of equipartition with the quantum hypothesis, gives us a very nice explanation of the shape of the blackbody spectrum that we see. Starting at long wavelengths and moving down, the characteristic energies are very low, so we just see an increase in the total amount of light in a particular band of wavelengths due to the increasing number of modes in that wavelength range. At short wavelength, though, the characteristic energy gets too big. So while the number of modes keeps going up, for many of them we get no light emitted at all. This cutoff happens very rapidly, which is why the short wavelength side of the peak drops off faster than the long wavelength tail. The amount of energy available due to heat increases as the temperature increases, which means that the frequency where the quantum cutoff happens goes up with temperature. And that's why the peak moves to shorter wavelengths for hotter objects. When you carry through all the gory mathematical details, what you end up with is exactly the formula that Planck had found empirically in 1899, but now with a grounding in the fundamental physics of equipartition. It also gives you a very particular value for the small number that multiplies the frequency to get the characteristic energy, what we now call Planck's constant. In modern units, it's 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joules per hertz, or 33 zeros to the right of the decimal point before you get to the 6626. That's an extremely small number to be sure, but it's very definitely not zero. Planck resorted to the quantum hypothesis out of desperation, but it was a smashing success. His black body formula has been tested over and over, at temperatures from the hottest stars to the cold of interstellar space. The cosmic microwave background radiation, light left over from just a few hundred thousand years after the Big Bang, fits perfectly to a black body spectrum with a temperature of only 2.71 degrees above absolute zero. Astronomers use Planck's formula to determine the temperature of distant objects by the light we observe from them. The touchless infrared thermometers that have become so common in regular health screenings do the same to figure out body temperature. The idea even shows up in the arts, when photographers and lighting designers talk about color temperature. That's based on the black body formula. Planck's black body model is a brilliant success and made him a famous and influential figure in German physics. The German network of national laboratories are the Max Planck Institutes in his honor. Planck himself was never entirely happy with his trick, though, despite its success. He held out hope that some other physicist would find a clever and elegant trick that would explain the black body formula without resorting to this ugly business of oscillators that can only emit integer multiples of some characteristic energy. This was not to be, though, because in 1905, an unknown patent clerk in Switzerland, with dreams of greater things,
picked up this idea and applied it to the light itself, and quantum mechanics really got rolling. That's a topic for our next lecture, though. For now, the important thing to remember is that any time you see a heating element glow that cheery red as you toast a slice of bread, you're looking at the place where quantum physics got its start.